infrastructure. Um, so, well, first of all, let me say that I'm happy to take some Q&A at the end of the talk. So hopefully I'll be talking for about one hour, but let's see how, how that goes. So um, the motivation for, for this paper is pretty straightforward. The development of transport infrastructure is a key public policy decision. First of all, in terms of expenses, uh, infrastructure projects are in general quite expensive. So for example, you can see that in the US about 2.3% of the GDP is devoted to, to transport infrastructure projects. In addition, transport infrastructure is normally very long lived. So these investments uh, take a long time um, to be, to be um, used. And in general, for example, for highways, the lifespan is about 20 years. And this is even higher for other types of infrastructure. These two features of transport infrastructure projects um, raise an important question which is uh, whether governments can adapt their transport infrastructure to changes in economic conditions. In this paper, I'm gonna exploit a unique episode of uh, a change in economic conditions, uh, the division of Germany in 1949, to quantify the gains from flexible infrastructure choice. So let me tell you why I'm gonna focus on this very specific historical episode. The goal of this project is to understand whether governments can adapt infrastructure to changes. And therefore, I'm going to focus on a very large scale shock that took place in 1949, which is the division of Germany. Um, I'm going to just talk you through a little bit of this background right now. So in the figure here, we can see the territory of Germany before um, the Second World War in the thicker black line. And the colors represent the territories that um, appeared after the end of the Second World War and uh, the division of Germany. So this uh, darker gray area became West Germany. This uh, uh, lighter gray area became East Germany. And these two other Eastern more territories were integrated into uh, Poland and the Soviet Union. As you can see from this figure, Germany was a country oriented in some sense to West to East and the geography changed dramatically once the division happened, when West Germany became basically oriented north-south and with a much uh, uh, different shape. In addition to this uh, very large uh, scale shock to geography, uh, the, the context of Germany is very interesting because the construction of the highway network started in the 1930s. And this means that there's gonna be some uh, rigidity in the transport network that is going to allow me to understand what are the gains from, uh, from the choice of infrastructure and adapting infrastructure. So as I was mentioning, the construction of the highway network started in the 1930s and by the time Germany got divided, um, these highway networks that you can see now in the figure had already been built. So as you can see, many of these links were planned to connect the whole country and were cut by the border after 1949. So I'm going to use this uh, very specific setting to answer two questions. First of all, um, what happened with the highway network during the division period? So how did West Germany adapt its infrastructure given this new change in geography? Uh, the second question I'm going to ask is, was uh, the initial investment on infrastructure that was done before for division, a cost or a constraint for the West German government, and did it affect welfare or, or a real income? So the way I'm going to be doing this is as follows. So first, I'm going to build a new quantitative trade model that um, endogenizes infrastructure choice. The setting is going is to be very similar to other papers that have been presented in this workshop. So trading different varieties, uh, network of locations, and mobility of workers. But the new part of this uh, framework is going to be a government that will choose infrastructure to maximize welfare. I'm going to take this model to the data. I'm going to calibrate the model to Germany before the division using historical data. And then I'm going to obviously test the predictions of the model uh, in two sets of tests. So first of all, I'll take the model and see how it fares in the cross section when I look at how the model can predict um, outcomes before the division. And a key important outcome will be whether my model is able to rationalize some of these highway plans that were proposed um, uh, before the division happened. Then I'm gonna take the model to test it against uh, uh, this unexpected change in geography, the division of Germany. And the idea here will be 
to look at whether the government can also rationalize the, the development of infrastructure after the division. Once I've uh, made sure that the model uh, delivers interesting and uh, good predictions, I'm going to use it to quantify these two questions. So first of all, um, what were the gains from reshaping infrastructure if the West German government was able to react to the shock? And second, what was the cost of rigidity due to these uh, pre-division investments? And let me clear now before I move on that for this project and today I'm only going to be talking about West Germany and I'm going to be focusing on the period before the German reunification. So I'm not going to be able to say much about East Germany or, or the later um, periods in time. So what do I find? Let me give you just a brief preview. First of all, um, I, I find that this quantitative spatial model can actually capture highway or infrastructure construction both uh, across the space uh, in the cross-section of regions, but also over time using this uh, time variation shock. Then um, my quantification shows me that there were large gains from partial reshaping of the highways after the division. So in the paper, I document that highways deviated from the pre-government uh, or the pre-war government plan. And indeed, this reshaping of highways that was done by the West German government increased real GDP by between 0.7 to 1.8%. So we see that partial reshaping was quite beneficial, but I also find that there was a large cost of path dependence. And this path dependence uh, was due to the pre-division investments. So as I showed you in the map, around 2000 kilometers had been built before division. And using the model, I find that removing these initial investments, allowing the government to organize the network from the beginning actually would have increased real income by an additional 1.6%. So a takeaway of uh, what I do in this uh, paper is that flexibility when choosing transport infrastructure seems to have very large aggregate welfare gains. Now let me tell you how my model and my work relates to previous literature. Obviously, um, first, firstly, I speak to the literature on endogenous transport networks. There's uh, very recent and super interesting papers. Um, in terms of the flavor of the model and in, in, on the uh, mechanisms, my paper is very close to what um, Allen and Arkolakis have done in their paper and what Fagelwan and Schall um, have done in their, own, in their own paper on infrastructure investments. My main contribution here is a test of how these models work with an exogenous change in geography, which is something that uh, had not been done before. The previous model had been calibrated and tested against the cross sections. Then more on the, uh, my fundamental results, I also contribute to this uh, literature on the persistence of history and economic activity um, that has talked about how uh, accidents in history can create some path dependence and affect the performance of regions. So this literature so far has mostly focused on comparing the, the performance of regions relative to one another. And in this paper, I can propose or um, um, I find a first aggregate quantification to the cost of path dependence. And the, the dependency in this model is going to come from infrastructure investments. Now, finally, I'm going to be talking about uh, the aggregate effects of transport infrastructure. And obviously, this is a very uh, thriving literature uh, to which many people that are for sure listening and also some of the panelists have contributed. To. And to this to place these infrastructure investments is going to have very important effects in shaping uh, the economic activity and then shaping uh, aggregate welfare. So let me tell you, sorry, let me see, uh, maybe I can take, do I see this a question, Claire, or should I? Uh, yep, we've got a clarifying question here, uh, okay. question clarifying. Um, path dependence is, if, if path dependence is due to investment in the 30s, did bombing not destroy those investments? Did, sorry? Did the I bombing not destroy it. those investments? Oh, uh, good, good point. So yeah, um, bombing mostly targeted the railway network because uh, the highway network was basically in pieces at this time. So most of the bombing targeted cities or, or the railway network. So to that extent, um, I'm only focusing on the investments that were not destroyed, obviously, but in, in the case of highways, it was not 
major concern. So let me tell you a bit more to, um, about the historical background and the data I'm going to use, and I can open it for questions a bit more um, as I go along. So I already mentioned uh, quite a bit of the of the background. But just let let you to let you know the overview of, of uh, the framework. Um, before World War II, uh, we can think of Germany as well integrated economically. And in the 1920s, there were the first initiatives to actually uh, build a modern highway network that were proposed. So these were a series of uh, plans by engineers that wanted to make sure. Um, that Germany would have a modern highway network built. Um, in 19th, so these uh, projects were basically not uh, approved by the government, by the parliament when they were proposed, but in some sense, um, this was the initial time when um, engineers thought about the highway network for Germany. Um, once the Nazi party um, got to power in Germany, uh, construction of the highway plan started. And um, the plan that was followed was very, very um, heavily dependent or inspired by the previous projects. Now, obviously, um, after a few years of highway construction, the World War II started, and obviously everything was stopped. And after the world start um, ended, uh, Germany was divided into East Germany and West Germany following the occupation of Germany by the Allied powers. What happened after division were, um, virtually uh, trade between East and West stopped, and also migration uh, between the East and the West of Germany was stopped uh, after a few years uh, after division. Let me now show you what happened with the highway network. I already mentioned that some of it was built before division. So this is the outline of the highway plan of the 1934 that the Nazi government started to build. And as you see, most or many of these links were supposed to be crossing the country and connecting all of the cities around Germany. If you fast forward um, 40 years to 1974, in the middle of division, this is how the network looked like. The network uh, in these two pictures has the same length. So for West Germany, that same amount of kilometers are appearing in both maps. And even if it's difficult to compare these two maps, I just want you to focus on two things. If you look at the border, you see that some of these links that had been planned were never completed. And second, if you look at the west side of the country, there's a larger density of investments uh, in the 1970s framework. Let us compare these two plans uh, in, a, in a more quantitative way. So if you classify the amount of kilometers that are built into what was built before the division and what was built after the division, we see that uh, before the division, 95% of the kilometers that are built are actually following the highway plan. So there was very little deviation. But after the division, there was actually a large part of reshaping. So the 3,000 kilometers built between 1950 and 1974 actually deviated from the original plan in about half of the cases. So this shows us that there was indeed a very large reshaping after the division. And that's what I'm going to be able to show. Um, and that's, that's what I want to capture with the, with the model. Before that, let me uh, give a couple of comments on uh, the uh, data. So basically, I'm going to use, as, as you may, may imagine, highway data from historical maps and road maps. I'm going to be using um, population from uh, historical census. And I'm going to be using some trade data to um, test the predictions of the model coming from uh, road shipments uh, by traffic districts and road shipments across the uh, West German states, both before and after the division. So let me um, go through the model. The model um, has uh, obviously um, an important element of geography. So the geography of this model has a set of regions that are linked through the transport network. These are going to be um, linking networks that are uh, neighbors that are adjacent. So you can think of Germany as a set of districts that in this case would be these squares in this small uh, picture that are connected through some links. This is going to be underlying network. And on top of this, there's going to be investments on infrastructure. So infrastructure investments that are going to be high 
are going to be at the district level and on the intensive margin, meaning that the government will choose how much to invest on infrastructure in each given district, and this is going to improve the quality of the links in that district. How are the um, costs? Martin, we've just got a clarifying yes. question. On sure. Martin, sorry to interrupt. We just got a clarifying question on uh, the previous slide. Uh, did post-war building exceed the 1934 plan? Um, so in other words, what, what yes. share of the 1934 plan was built in West Germany? Yes, so the the post the post-war building did exceed the plan. So by the 19, probably late 1980s, already more more highway construction had happened and it's still ongoing now. So so far what I'm doing is to compare uh, up to a period when the amount of construction is equal to the plan so that we can basically see which places were chosen. But um, uh, in the paper, I think I have the whole uh, figure of, of network that of course went, went on being built. Something that we could look at is whether the pattern basically changed at some point. This is a very good question. Okay. So, um, sorry, as, as I was saying, the infrastructure is gonna be at the district level and on the intensive margin. Um, the shipping cost in this network is going to be basically defined by the links. So it's going to be a cost associated with transiting any link that is uh, connecting a couple of regions I and J. And this is going to be a function of distance, obviously, that is going to be exogenous and a measure of infrastructure quality that is going to be endogenous. So just to give you an example, if you want to ship something along the link between District 3 and District 6, um, I assume this functional form that is basically the average uh, shipping cost along this distance, um, taking into account the quality of the network, that is this phi. So this is just the average between the two districts. It could be some other functional form. What is important to notice is that this phi is basically reducing the cost of distance. And there is some elasticity here that tells you how much one unit of investment is going to reduce the transport cost. So this is just the shipping along each link, and we can define from this uh, the transport net, the transport cost. So the transport cost is just going to be. Clara. Even, sorry. Clara, uh, Clara, can I ask a clarifying yeah. question? Yeah. Uh, so am I reading correctly your your functional form for the for the cost that the investment is location specific but not bilateral in some sense? I mean the the effect of investment is is at the local level and not at the pair level. Yes, that's completely okay. right. So it's some, it's some kind of simplification that I'm uh, actually expanding right now to have this investment at the link level. But yeah, the, you're completely right. So this the assumption is going to be that instead of choosing links, you choose districts. And that gives a good mapping to the outcomes. But um, I'm planning to, to at least expand it or allow for link link specific investments, yes. Okay, so transport costs are going to be defined in the model as shipping along the least cost path, um, given or taking into account both the distance and the infrastructure quality. So, for example, if you want to ship things uh, between uh, this district in the top, District 3 and District 9, um, given that infrastructure investment was equal everywhere, the shortest path would be this straight line. So the transport cost would just be this sum of... Uh, of um, um, shipping costs along the least cost path. And more general, you can write this down um, as a sum uh, of all the districts where you only take into account the costs along the least cost path. So for example, here I'm thinking of uh, any pair of uh, regions N and M, and the only omegas that would appear here are the ones for which this indicator variable takes value one that indicates that these uh, districts are going to be along the least cost path. So just to mention here that uh, this is a bit different from the standard trade cost uh, formulations where uh, these costs are purely bilateral. In this case, obviously, the infrastructure level in uh, other districts may affect bilateral transport costs because of this uh, shipping along the network. OK, so let me just go to the spatial equilibrium part of the model. 
ask yes. one clarifying question there. So, so the least cost route is allowed to change, like that's a function of the distribution of those fundamentals everywhere? Yes, exactly. So there's going to be a transport problem that's going to be solved and then the spatial equilibrium problem. Great. Marta, there's another, there's another clarifying question here. Yeah, does, sure. uh, con does congestion play a role in your model? And is it important at that time in the German context? Um, that's a great question. Thank you. So um, I'm not going to allow for congestion in my setting, which means that the cost of shipping is not going to depend on the quantity being shipped. I think that for the region, for the years I'm focusing on, which is uh, until uh, mid 70s, maybe this was not such a big issue. I'm sure that in Germany right now, um, congestion uh, along highways is probably an issue. So it would be interesting to expand or to allow for congestion and see if things would change. I think in my setting, it's not, it's not such a big problem. Great. Okay. There, there's, a, there's actually another question, which I think is quite, oh. quite fitting. Does the railway construction or railway infrastructure in general interfere with, with the highway infrastructure? That's a very good point as well. A fantastic question. Thank you. So um, overall, yes, we would think of both uh, means of transportation. Um, in my setting, the railway network had been built um, by the early 1910s in Germany and in some sense stayed quite stable. So I'm gonna be thinking of, hey, of the railway as some sort of a level effect that it connects your money better and the highway is the one that is changing over time. So I'm gonna be thinking mostly in my empirical application on differences. So I hope to take care of most of the part that, that is done by railways, but one of the things I want to do is to um, allow for also shipping by rail if, if, the, if the least cost path is by the railway network. So that's an extension I'm working on, yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Did I? Yeah. Okay. So, oh, sorry. So let me go through the spatial equilibrium part. Uh, this is uh, quite standard, uh, follows very closely the framework um, by Steve Redding in the Journal of International Economics. So there's going to be uh, a set of agents that have a utility given by a CS composite of uh, tradable varieties uh, with a share of uh, alpha and land with a share of one minus alpha and workers are going to be uh, mobile, but uh, imperfectly mobile, because they're going to have some idiosyncratic preferences for locations, uh, as it's very standard in this literature. So land, I assume, is uh, in fixed supply at the district, and there's going to be some rent that will clear the local housing market. And the production is going to be a la Krugman 1980. So there's going to be differentiated varieties produced under monopolistic competition by local firms. And uh, these firms will be using labor, labor uh, as a factor of production. And labor productivity will be given by this exogenous AI that is going to be also region or district specific. Um, in the baseline model, I only consider domestic trade. International trade was not so large um, um, in these early periods, but I'm going to consider international trade in, in an extension. And finally, given this framework, we can define um, the spatial equilibrium. So given this infrastructure network and the cost of shipping through the network and the fundamental parameters, uh, there's going to be a set of population distribution uh, or population allocations and prices for which the markets are going to clear and expected utility will equalize. This is fairly standard. So the part of the model that is new is uh, the endogenous choice of infrastructure. So on top of this spatial equilibrium structure, I'm going to have a choice of the government to build infrastructure. And the way I'm going to set up this problem is I'm going to assume that the government is well-intentioned and wants to maximize aggregate welfare. And for the measure of aggregate welfare, I just take the expected utility measure that comes from this class of models uh, following the previous literature. So the government's problem is as follows. Uh, the government will choose a vector of investments across different districts to maximize its expected utility. And it's going to be um, constrained by the following um, conditions. So first of all, the decentralized equilibrium allocation will have to hold. So the government will understand how the, markets, the uh, goods market will clear, which is these two first equations, how people will choose to allocate across the territory, and how rent will clear. In addition to these decentralized equilibrium conditions, the government will also be constrained by the cost transport cost minimization. 
So the assumption I make here is that um, trade costs are always going to be minimized in equilibrium, and you could microfound this uh, in a better way. So, for example, and then Anatolakis have this uh, 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 very neat expression of traders that are a bit heterogeneous and ship along the least cost routes. This would be similar to what I'm assuming, but I'm assuming there's no heterogeneity. So every trader would ship through the minimum cost route. Um, uh, Pablo and Eduard also make an assumption of a perfectly competitive transport sector. So I'm basically taking a shortcut, but the prediction or the um, end goal is similar. And then finally, obviously, we have a budget constraint. So this is also set in the simplest possible way, something that I would also like to explore a bit more. So far, I'm going to assume there's a fixed set of resources, the sea, that the government is able to allocate across the economy. So the government will not choose how much to invest on infrastructure. It will just decide how to allocate these infrastructure investments. And you could have different costs of building infrastructure um, um, for different districts. So let me push through a little bit and tell you the qualitative predictions of the model. So obviously, this problem of the government will give rise to an expression that has a form of a marginal benefit equal marginal cost. So the amount of investment that the government will choose for a given district J is going to be the amount that equalizes the marginal benefit from, from building infrastructure to the marginal cost. For intuition, to give you some, some idea of how what is driving infrastructure investment in the model, let's, let's go to the stripped down version of the model, assume that there's no housing, that there's no mobility, and that the least cost paths are stable. So think of a small change in infrastructure. This first order condition um, would look um, as follows in this expression. The infrastructure investment in district J um, here, phi J, is going to be proportional or, um, or a function of two terms. First of all, the size of J. And this is just the amount of trade that J does with the rest of the economy. So as you can see, exports from other places to J and imports um, or exports from J to other places in the economy. And then uh, an additional term that is going to appear um, in this model, that is the centrality of J. The centrality of J will be how central is District J uh, for shipments that go around the country. So in this case, this um, um, term, this summation, as you can see, it's a basically a sum across all the districts. And it's going to be big when a lot of these indicators take value one, which means that a lot of the least cost paths across the network are going to transit district J. So in this model, um, infrastructure investments are going to be increasing with the importance of a district as a source of trade, so big cities, for example, but also with the importance of a district as a hub. So if a district is a trade transit area, if it's uh, in the middle of two big regions, this district is also going to be important and infrastructure is also going to be allocated in this district. Um, let me tell you now, before I go to the calibration of the model, just a couple of words on how I solve uh, the model. So as I was showing you before, the model nests both a transport problem and a spatial equilibrium problem in the government uh, uh, problem. So given the transport network, which means the graph of regions, sorry, districts and the investments, I can solve for the matrix of transport costs. And as it was mentioned before, I don't have congestion. So I can solve for this without solving for the entire equilibrium. And then given the parameters, the fundamentals and these uh, transport costs, you can solve for the spatial equilibrium and the welfare. And I assume parameter conditions such that if the tra trade costs are quasi symmetric, which they're going to be in my model because there's no um, directional transport costs, this equilibrium is going to be unique and stable. And this is following the, the um, results from the Alenana Kolakis 2014 work, but also as Steve Redding derives this condition in, in his paper. So this means that uh, even if the model may seem complicated, basically given an investment vector, you can compare, you can compute the spatial equilibrium that will be unique and stable. And then the algorithm I use to solve this is an interior point algorithm where you start from an investment vector and the parameters, you solve for the spatial equilibrium, and then the algorithm will take a utility maximizing steps to find the optimum.
So I find a local optimum in this, with this algorithm. I, can, I cannot uh, guarantee that this is a global optimum, but basically I do robustness checks, um, like perturbations from the network to make sure that this local optimum is actually uh, at least very stable or a very good approximation to the solution. And uh, maybe before we go to the calibration, I can stop and see if there are some questions that I can take now. Um, great. There's Should one clarifying question by, yeah. by Tommaso, huh? which is why did you decide to focus only on the allocation of investment and not on the level of investment? Um, I see. So that's a good question. Um, I would love to also think about the level. Basically, in my setting, I am, I'm going to calibrate the level to what the government was doing. And I'm going to examine how was this allocated across country factors. But something very interesting would be to think about how much investment on infrastructure should there be in an economy. So it's, it's a very different problem, a uh, very interesting one, I think. But for this setting, what I wanted to do is just to calibrate the level to the data and basically look at the patterns. I see. And then we have, uh, we have two more or three more clarifying questions. Another one comes from Carlos Hurtado. What happens if there are many least cost paths in your framework? It's um, a good point. So um, actually, I don't know. Um, I guess that due to the amount of regions we have, I have like around 400 districts for the whole network or 300 for West Germany. Um, I guess it would be unlikely that this would be equal to the decimal, but actually I'm, I use an algorithm for the least cost path. So I'm not sure um, how, how this case is dealt with. I have to look at that. It's a great question. Thank you. Great. One, one last one here is, uh, yeah. is, is a, it's a quick one. Do you know what portion of trade in Germany was happening through highways versus waterway or, or railways? Yeah, so that's a, yeah, 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 that's a very important question for sure. Um, so we do have some idea of the shipment uh, volumes. Um, at the beginning of the sample, I do have a plot somewhere, so maybe I can go later on to, to this one, but basically at the beginning of, of my period, 1950s, um, there's uh, two thirds of shipments that are happening actually by railways and um, one third by road although short uh, distance shipments are much bigger by road in general. But then over the period that I'm examining, the road network can becomes much more important. And by 1980, it's already uh, uh, more important in terms of amount of goods moved than the railways. So that's why I think that um, this is the right, basically the time in, the point in time when highways become really the dominating uh, transportation mean. I see, very good. Do you want to take one other question that is kind of less uh, clarifying, but more dis discussion, or or you want to do that afterwards? Uh, I w I don't know. <laughs> How is it? Like, yeah, yeah. Tell yeah. Me. Let's let then let's take maybe Jeff Jeff's question since that's kind of model related before we okay. move on to the day. Yeah. Jeff, Perfect. do you do you do you want to ask a question, Jeff? Jeff. So let, so let me ask his question, which he typed out. Should we think of the results on city sizes from Reading and Sturm 2008 paper as implicitly incorporating an endogenous infrastructure relocation mechanism? So in Reading and Sturm 2008, is there implicitly already such a, such a mechanism? So um, it's difficult to say because they are using the variation is basically coming from how close are uh, cities to the border. And what I find here is that basically you should also think of how well connected you are to West Germany through the transport network. So in some sense, maybe they're not picking the whole effect, but at least in what respects, like in what regards to cities, I'm using districts. So they're only using, uh, I think, uh, I don't know, 50 cities or some, 20 cities, something like that. But yeah, I mean, the, the population effects that they find, which are not so huge, actually would incorporate the fact that the government reacted to some extent but some of the infrastructure was actually built already yes right thank you very much i think yeah, let's move sure. on so let me go to the calibration and test of the model um basically to calibrate the model i use very standard techniques that um, people before me have used and people in this room for sure so 
First, I calibrate the spatial equilibrium to the before division period using historical data. The, thing I'm, the first thing I'm going to do is to uh, read from the maps, basically, the road network in the 1930s. And then I'm going to calibrate the spatial equilibrium parameters uh, following a mix of methods. Some of them are calibrated externally. Some of them I calibrate to the 1930s uh, German economy. And then there's one parameter that is more specific, that is this returns to highway investments that I uh, calibrate using simulated method of moments. And I find that highway investments have uh, marginal decreasing returns. And then in addition to these parameters that are more standard, I need to calibrate the division of Germany. So for this, what I do is to um, modify the infrastructure network by allowing for roads, local roads uh, to be there, basically the links. And I constrain the government to build the highways that have been built by 1950. So this is going to be a constraint in the model once I solve for the um, optimal infrastructure investment after division. Then I'm going to use uh, the same spatial equilibrium parameters. I'm going to hold everything constant. But I'm going to obviously allow for the population, uh, the total population to, to grow to the 1974 level in West Germany. And I'm only going to be considering the locations in West Germany. So essentially, the, the welfare function will only include West German districts. And finally, um, in the extension, I'm going to allow for trade with Western Europe only for the post division period, because this is the this basically in, um, overlaps with the European, the starting of the European integration movement, which probably was, was quite important. So um, I calibrate the model and I test it, as I mentioned, in two ways. So the first test that I kind of propose is basically using the cross section. And we know from all the previous work that in general, these models do a very good job in, uh, in for example, predicting trade flows. But I can test my model with a new prediction, which is about highway investments. And I'm going to propose a test to compare the highway investments predicted by the model with the 1930 um, highway plan. This is the, the early highway plans by engineers, not the actual uh, Nazi plan or the 1934 um, um, plan adapted by, by the Nazi government. In addition, I can propose a second test of the model that are based on the unexpected division of Germany. And this set of tests are basically out of sample because I'm calibrating the model to before division and trying to see how the model predicts in the post division period. And for this, once again, I would love to show you all the tests that are um, on the paper. But basically, as uh, the question uh, that I just got, the paper by, by Reading and Stern um, already shows that this type of model uh, can capture the population changes in West Germany. And same for the change in trade flows. But I'm going to be able to test the new prediction of the model, which is uh, on new highway investments compared to the post division highway construction in the data. So let me go instead of through all the tests just to show you how the model is able to explain the 1930s highway plan and whether the model can capture these uh, new investments during the division period. So now I'm going to show you first the pre-division period um, scenario, basically. So these two maps show the model's prediction in this first panel on uh, infrastructure investments. And the second panel is the 1930s um, highway allocation. So these, these uh, two uh, maps show the amount of kilometers uh, investment invested in a given district. And the intensity of the color is basically the number of kilometers. So districts that are uh, darker red are basically districts where there's several or long uh, highways or intersections of highways. So from these two pictures, I just want to show that um, there's some clear pattern that the model captures. So obviously, you want to connect the big population centers. So you find this uh, sort of radial pattern from uh, Berlin, that was the biggest city at the, at the time, and that you also see in the pre-division model, sorry, in the 1930s plan. But obviously, there are some differences. So I'm going to be comparing these two in a more quantitative way in, in a second. This is for the pre-division period. So I calibrated the model to this economy, and I asked where to place infrastructure network. Now, you can also do this for the post-division period. So in this case, what I'm going to do is to impose 
simulate the division shock and ask sorry. where, to, yeah, sorry. Sorry, Martin, there's a clarifying question on the previous yeah. slide from Matthias Hölzlein. How do we think about Eastern Germany or the Eastern part of Germany in that period? Uh, in that period, you mean before division? Uh, exactly. Um, so if you mean Eastern, like uh, the more, yeah, so the border here is the nowadays German border. Obviously exactly. the model, yeah, the model, if, if you see um, here, the model under predicts investments in the Eastern border because there was nothing else to go basically. So, I mean, in that sense, in the model, you are assuming that there's nothing else. And um, we know why in some sense, this, this, uh, this failure is there. I could add some, 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 yeah, I could add the extra uh, Eastern territory. So I guess that that would make right. this, uh, these two maps look even, even more similar, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, no, that, I should have mentioned that, thank you. So, um, Let's go now to the post division um, case. So in this case, I'm showing you only West Germany. And what the model, the, the map shows you now is not the total stock of highway kilometers, but the change in kilometers. So the increase in investment. And for the model panel, which is this uh, first figure, it's clear that the objective is to build infrastructure in a north-south dimension and to connect basically all of the German bigger German cities very well with each other. So you even have a second uh, link uh, more to the West and the pattern of the model is in some sense uh, quite clear. The, the investment I see in the data is a bit more um, heterogeneous. So you do find high, high investment level basically or intensity in this no Northern part, but then there are other things that are going on that the model is not able to capture. And obviously this would mean that something else may have been going on why uh, the 1970s investment is not exactly the same as the model. Now, to compare these two maps, what I'm going to do is to measure uh, the transport costs. So a very easy way to compare these predictions is see whether the districts that are assumed to become closer or better connected in the model are actually the same ones that are better connected in the data. So I can use these two maps to compute the change in transport costs if you build the 1930s plan or the model and compare this to the local roads um, example of transport cost. And for the post division, I'm gonna do the same. I'm gonna measure the change in transport cost um, in the data. So given the 1974 network or given the model and show you how well these two measures correlate. So this is what you can see in this uh, table. Um, the first column is the test in the pre-division period. The second two columns are the test in the post division period. So if you focus on the first column, you can see that um, if I compute the, ch the change in transport costs from building the 1930s plan, basically from a network without any highways, the model is able to predict a large part of this and especially explain a big part of the variation in transport costs, so 70% of the variation. This uh, may be not so surprising because I already calibrated the model to this geography, obviously. But if you look at the post-division performance, it's actually even better. So if I compute the change in transport cost between the 1950s network and the 1974 network, which districts become better connected, and I regress that on the predictions of the model, the model is able to explain 97% of this variation. And to give some reference, I can also compute the change in transport cost in the counterfactual construction of the 1930s plan. So this is the last row here. And again, the plan would also be a very good proxy for uh, this change in transport cost, but actually the model outperforms the plan. So these uh, two columns that are telling you that the model does a better job at predicting which districts became better connected in the post division period than the 1930s uh, highway plan. So I take these two tests as a good uh, confirmation of, of uh, the quality of the model. And then I'm gonna use the model to, to make some predictions and to make some quantification um, exercises. So um, maybe I can take, is there any clarifying question or I mean, we can also leave them for later, I don't know. Uh, I think I think we leave them for later, they're more substantive. Okay, perfect, longer, yeah. So that's great, let me go to the quantification. 
So um, the goal is to understand gains from highway reshaping. And I uh, mentioned two very specific exercises or, or questions that I had in mind. So the first thing I want to understand is the gains from partial reshaping after division. As I showed you, I documented that a big part of this network, about half of the construction post division actually deviated from the 1930s plan. So what I want to answer is, um, what if the West German government had actually followed the 1930s plan without any reshaping? What if they had continued with what had been planned uh, before the war? So for this, I'm gonna use the model just as a measuring tool to quantify the welfare gains from the highway network as I see it in the data in 1974, and to compare this with how the welfare would have looked like if you build the 1930s highway plan. This uh, counterfactual is mostly uh, data driven, but then I'm gonna answer a second question, which is a bit um, harder, which is what was the cost of rigidity due to pre-division investments? So as you, as I showed you in the introduction, part of these highways were built before the division. And the question that I want to answer here is what if the West German government could have even reshaped those initial investments or uh, if they had been able to plan without any constraints? So for this, I'm gonna use the model to again solve for the unconstrained network and compare these two model-based networks, the, the constraint efficient network and the unconstrained efficient network. So let me go to the first counterfactual, the aggregate effects of highway reshaping. And now I'm gonna show you again the two maps, but this is uh, for West Germany, the stock of highways, so not the change, but basically the highway network translated into districts. As you can see, um, the highway network in 1974 looks a lot like the 1934 highway plan. Some of it had been built before, but there are some differences and mostly are, they are located in the Western part of the country. So the 1974 network put a bit more emphasis on the Western side of the country and uh, not so much on the, in some sense, inner German border. How important were these modifications, these small deviations from the plan? Well, we can measure this in terms of welfare, aggregate welfare. If you compare this to the uh, no highway scenario where I just allow for local roads and I measure welfare. Well, in this case, uh, you can see here that the 1974 highway performs better than the 1930s plan. So the West German government actually did a good job in uh, reshaping the highway network. And I find that the government's choice actually increased welfare by 1.24% and real GDP by 0.7%. Uh, so these small deviations that were actually um, not such a big share of the total network, about one third, increased welfare by, by an important amount. Now, obviously this model is not taking into account that in the 1950s and 60s, we had a process of economic integration in Europe so I wanted to take into account the fact that maybe um, the, the, the welfare gains would change if we consider trade with European Union or with uh, European countries. So I extended the model to allow for trade with France, Netherlands, Belgium, and Italy. And what happens here is that if you, oh, sorry, if you repeat this counterfactual, the difference is even larger. So the plan of the 1930s was even worse suited for transportation with uh, the new German in some sense, if you think also, if you allow for trade with France. In this case, the gains uh, go up to 2% or 1.8% of welfare. So this is for what the government had done, the, the flexibility that was allowed basically by the setting. And now let me just uh, spend the, the last uh, five, 10 minutes to talk about the cost of path dependence. So, as, uh, we, as I showed you when we started the, the presentation, the, a big part of the network was built before the division. So there were about 2000 kilometers built um, in the 1930s. And a lot of this network was actually built connecting the Eastern cities in Germany to Berlin. So obviously this was all uh, not useful once the border was in place and trade was not allowed. And what I want to know is whether this initial investment created some kind of constraint. So for this, uh, um, I solved already for the constraint efficient network. So this is assuming that what, what had been built could not be reshaped. This is the um, solution that we get from the model. 
And if you allow for the government to actually build the network only for wealth zero money from scratch, then you would find something different. So the main message is obviously that there's no reason why you should want to connect to the East since trade and population mobility is not allowed. And the government, uh, the model would just place most of the investments in this North, South and sort of uh, Southern part of Germany. So how important was this in aggregate effects if you compare these two networks, when we can compare this now to uh, the 1974 level of welfare given by the 1974 highways, which are the ones that I have been showing you. In this case, um, obviously the unconstrained network performs better than the constrained one. And in some sense, obviously both these networks uh, expand welfare compared to the 1974 um, highway network that comes from the government decision. But basically the difference between these two is quite big. So um, this cost of path dependence was actually about 1.6% of the 1974 welfare. And this is, uh, I'm focusing on this difference because obviously even if the model is missing many things, um, even when you give the model the best chance at explaining or at, at reshaping the data, these constraints were, were quite important in terms of the aggregate welfare. So this 1.6% is uh, quite substantive and it's about 10% of the, of the 1974 um, gains, the gains from the 1974 network. So let me just uh, try to wrap up and maybe take some questions uh, later on. So basically I, I have two different messages from this paper. The first one is that this quantitative model is able to explain the highway construction, both in the cost section and also um, new highway construction. What I find is that the choice of infrastructure actually shapes um, aggregate gains. And uh, I look at this from two angles. So first of all, the way in which the government adapted the network to the division of Germany actually increased real GDP um, by a very large number. So from, uh, up to 2%, we think of the new geography also as including trade with France. So the government did a good job. But in addition, uh, obviously, there were some initial investments that could not be changed. And this created some path dependence. And uh, I quantify this uh, cost to be uh, um, around 1.6% of the real GDP um, of uh, Germany in 1974. So there are large gains from flexibility, but obviously um, the, there was this large cost of path dependence because these uh, investments were made before the division could be anticipated. Now, in terms of um, things that I believe uh, would be future work or extensions to, to this paper, I think that um, obviously this is all conditional on your money not reunifying and something that we could look at is what happened once the reunification was possible and whether there were further costs of path dependence uh, from there. But in addition, in this model, I just considered a government that was, sorry, that was very um, well-intentioned and following economic factors. Now, what if we allow for other type of factors such as um, political uh, interest to drive infrastructure investments? I think that's something that very, uh, something very interesting to, to look at. And then uh, obviously thinking of other agents taking decisions or um, other types of uh, transport infrastructure. So I'm done with the presentation and happy to take any more questions or comments. Thank you very much, Marta, for a great talk. Let me also just say that Claire, I'm asking questions because Claire has, a connect, has some connectivity issues. Uh, I think Chris had a good question that was kind of related to your last point. Maybe Chris, you still want to, to ask it or comment briefly. Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, so great paper, thanks for presenting this to us. Um, and so of course, we know that infrastructure is often assigned for political reasons. Um, and so what's really cool about your model is it provides a way to maybe actually uh, uncover what those political reasons are. Your model explains a lot of infrastructure investment, but maybe, you know, the residuals are enlightening for what the political economy that shapes uh, the rest of infrastructure placement is. And that could be really cool and also provide uh, a source of maybe additional variation. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's a great comment. I think it's, uh, you're completely right. Uh, the model is uh, in some sense, uh, just thinking of uh, economic efficiency, but obviously 
we know that politicians or um, um, political motives are important in, in infrastructure construction. So I have not done or looked at this so much. I did do one test on whether voting for the Nazi party actually predicted some of these deviations from the model and you see you see some some of it going on. So in, indeed, um, we know that the high investment, for example, during the during the 1930s was a very politicized uh, um, event. And I, I agree it would be very nice to to look at these uh, residuals and see if we can uncover other other motives of of a decision or something behind the infrastructure. Hopefully with uh, with modern data, because one of the limitations I have here is that uh, a lot of the data is not really available because of the historical setting. Very good. There was a, a, a clarifying question from Kong Peng, uh, which kind of... Ke, ke... Sorry? Sorry, there was, an, there was a clarifying question from Kong Peng uh, that yeah. I'm just going to pause. How did you, can you kind of remind us about what in the data allows you to calibrate region specific marginal cost of highway construction? So where does yeah. that come from? Yeah, so um, basically I take the network from uh, the maps. So I take the underlying links from the local road network, meaning that I'm already in some sense using the networks that have been built and I don't have to deal with whether you're gonna build over a mountain or across a river. So because I'm using the actual network of local roads, I just assume that in some sense, upgrading them to highway should be similar. In the in the regressions on the transport costs, at some point I also uh, added a control for, for uh, elevation. But in some sense, what I'm assuming is just the cost of construction is uh, homogeneous everywhere. I see, thank you for clarifying that. So Tommaso had, I think, made a great point. Unfortunately, he had to leave early today for, for another call. But uh, there is kind of a, uh, I should say, like a, a tradition of evaluating such infrastructure projects as like the return on the dollar spent rather than changes to aggregate GDP. So why did you choose to look at, you know, GDP benefits instead of return on the dollar comparisons between different plans? Hmm. So um, I guess I wanted to speak to the literature on um, aggregate, gains, aggregate gains from infrastructure. And on, in that literature, um, the consensus, I think, or the, the way to measure the gains is normally with this uh, kind of aggregate measure. Um, but I agree it would be quite interesting to, to check in some sense, uh, to compare the maps by the return on the dollar. So I, I wanted to make sure that my model um, was weight calibrated and was giving me good predictions, for example, for the 1974 network, I find that the welfare gains are 16%. And this is very similar to what uh, Melanie Morton finds uh, in the paper about Brazil and the construction of the highway networks, about a 15% gain from, from highway investment. So in that sense, it allowed me to compare a bit more to other countries. But uh, I, I take the point. Yeah, it, it would be for sure super policy relevant as well. Yeah. Um, Gabriel, why don't you? ask a question. You, I see you raising your hand there. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Marta. This is super interesting. Um, I wanted to ask if you can say a bit more about, if you can use the model to help understand simpler uh, decision rules. So in particular, I'm thinking of uh, a government that would take, uh, would try to naively and greedily uh, assign infrastructure in places where the trade passing through that place are, are highest. So maybe maybe uh, improving infrastructure uh, increases speeds and they just want to put the, the next dollar of infrastructure where they uh, you know, decreased aggregate travel times the most or something along those lines. And I have like a two-step question in a way. So can you simulate something like that uh, and see how it compares uh, to, to the actual optimum? And the second is, I wonder how this plays out over time. Like if highways are built over 20 years, then there is some time for the general equilibrium to, so the populations and trades to adjust. So I wonder if that's actually going to be not so bad. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, Gabriel. Yeah. So um, on the first point, you are completely right. So in that sense, I'm taking the the government is maximizing aggregate welfare that I take um, following the previous literature to be this expected utility, but 
um, as you can see, the problem of the government could be rewritten to maximize something else. So the, 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 the function of the government could be changed. And one thing you could do is to try to uh, build infrastructure in the places with highest traffic or maximize, I don't know, uh, total traffic uh, in some regions that are very central. So in that sense, I'm, I mean, I'm of course, I'm very interested in this topic. So I'm, I would be really interested in exploring um, basically the outcome of other decision decision making um, uh, process. So that's uh, thanks for the comment. I, that's a great suggestion. And second, on the um, on the what was the second question? Sorry, can you repeat? Sorry. So um, the second part, in a way, is even so holding the same welfare function. Oh, time, yes. Yeah, I wonder if some of these naive rules. I, I wonder how they perform uh, basically. Yeah, uh, compared no, to the actual optimal. That's a very good, yeah. So of course uh, the model is uh, static and basically I'm calibrating it at two periods in time, but obviously um, if you want to take this to settings where urbanization is very fast, for example, like if you take a setting to a place like India, you'd probably want to, like you probably want to calibrate this every five or 10 years because uh, at some point, uh, obviously um, the the trade flows and the people flows are gonna be very different. So that's that's a very good that's a very good point. And in some sense, I could try try to run this uh, in smaller periods. I could try to maximize infrastructure investments by decade in some sense and see whether I get to a different solution. That's a that's a good suggestion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. We have another question coming in from Matthias Hölzlein of Berkeley. Matthias, do you want to ask it yourself? Oh yeah, I think you in a sense answered this because you want to extend this. I think there is a, I mean, first of all, I think there's a lot of political argument that the German Western government, Western German government never wanted to accept the fact that it got divided. So and often, you know, <clears throat> acted as if that would change quickly and then it actually did change. So yeah, I think it would be interesting to take into account, especially the path dependence, right? That these highways that go to the east, they might have actually turned out to be useful at some point. Mm. So how would you approach that kind of thing? Yeah, so that's, a, I mean, yeah, that's a fantastic point for sure. Um, first, let me say that in this model, uh, in some sense, if you see what I find in the model, it's very tilted towards the west and very north-south oriented, because in the model, the probability of division or of the division persistent is one. One thing you could do is to give some probability in some sense to the reunification. And then you would find some investments that are done towards the East because you're in some sense anticip anticipating that that reunification could happen. So that's something I could try. And relative to how to measure whether there's path dependence, you know, from division to reunification, what you could do is to think of nowadays Germany and optimize the network and see what you would do. Or um, uh, take my counterfactual of no initial investments to the east, build the division specific network. And then if you open up the country, you're probably going to find that you have too many north south connections and basically no connection to the east. So in some sense, you're, you're completely right. This, uh, this in some sense mistake of not building so much, uh, building too much towards the east at some point paid off because indeed uh, Germany got, got reunified. So that your intuition is completely right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Amata, we have another question coming in from a German. Uh, Christian, <laughs> why don't you ask a question yourself, which I think is very really good. Christian, you have to unmute yourself. Right. Does it work now? Yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. So in Germany, you have these uh, two different types of highway, right? So you have the Autobahn and you have the Schnellstrasse. And they are often uh, interconnected. So you have uh, two pieces of autobahn that are connected by a piece of Schnellstrasse. And somehow in your maps, it looks like you're only using autobahn, right? Yeah, but that's right. Some pretty weird shortest cost path that don't mm. the true distance, right? I see. So what I did was to take the, the federal highways or federal roads that had been built by 1930 and local roads to make the network in some sense connect with every district. But you're completely right. I'm taking 
uh, regional roads or federal roads and, and local roads as being the same and autobahns being of, of higher quality. So my experiment is which uh, links you want to upgrade to autobahn basically. But I could do this in some sense, this different um, cost thresholds like local roads, then uh, these uh, federal roads that you're mentioning and the autobahn. So that's something I could I could uh, take a look into. Thanks. Yeah, the insight from uh, German German uh, audience is always <laughs> the great the greatest. Uh, I think that's great. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. There was another question by Seth Morgan. Um, Seth, maybe you want to ask your question yourself. You have to unmute yourself. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, this is just to really to help me kind of understand how much you're learning from that baseline calibration. Um, if you wanted to see how much the later network is impacted by political factors, do you have to assume that that original 1934 plan was uh, pure, you know, purely going according to your model and maximizing welfare, or is there how much room is there for that plan being political as well? That's a very, very good question. Um, so no, you don't need to assume that the 1930s is optimal at all. So um, the decision I made in this paper is to calibrate my model. Um, there's only one parameter that is calibrated to the 1930s plan, which is um, how concentrated should uh, highways be. And I just want to take, make sure that you don't want to build highways around Berlin, for example, that at some point that is decreasing your, your benefits. But um, the model does not uh, target directly the 1930s plan. So that's why if you believe that my model actually proxies for the economic incentives behind infrastructure, then the residual, as was mentioned before, the difference could be then regressed on, um, I don't know, voting shares or um, regional uh, inequalities to see whether there's something that's going on. So that, that would come from the difference between the data and the model. It's something I didn't explore yet, yes. Thank you very much, Seth. And uh, there's a last comment left by Tommaso, which you will receive later on as a transcript matter. Okay. So I think uh, we will leave it here. And Perfect. we hope to see you all uh, back next week. And thank you again very much, Marta, for your time and thank for a so great much. talk.